Hi folks, uh, this is Jason and uh, hope you are okay today. And it's good to be with you. Um, giving a public lecture on uh, Christianity and atheism. Um, this is a, a seminar that uh, I produce for my local church. Um, we're doing a month of evangelism and uh, I was asked to prepare a seminar and um, this is five six years in the making and I've talked to thousands of atheists read some of the key books and um, so what I'm going to give you is um, a lecture uh, a professional lecture giving you um, a lot of uh, experience and this will help you if you are a Christian and you're doing evangelism and you're sharing the gospel on the streets uh, this seminar or this lecture will help you uh, to reach out to atheists so without further ado we'll, I'm gonna pray and then do the lecture Father God we thank you for this day and we thank you for your love and for your grace and we give you the praise we give you the glory and we give you the honor today we thank you for this day we thank you for your love and we thank you that you're our god today and so lord i praise you and worship you today and i give you the glory and the honor and uh, lord we just commit this lecture to you now father i pray it bring you glory i pray it be a great help to people I pray that it would save souls and I pray that it would equip your people to do apologetics and to be a great help to people. I ask this Lord in your name and for your glory. Amen. May your Holy Spirit be with us now, Lord, in your name. Amen. Okay. The definition of atheism is disbelief or lack of belief in the existence of God or gods. That's the Oxford Dictionary definition disbelief or lack of belief in the existence of god or gods oxford dictionary now even though that's the oxford dictionary uh, definition um atheists will most atheists not all will add something on this they will say not only is atheism a disbelief or a lack of belief in the existence of god or gods but it's also a a lack of belief due to a lack of evidence for God or gods and that key word a lack of evidence is a big thing for atheists they they major on this and uh, you would be unwise uh, if you encountered an atheist to discuss with an atheist you would be unwise not to have an understanding of their understanding of how they define atheism so that's the general understanding that most atheists have. There'll be nuances. Uh, there's been debates amongst atheists. Uh, well, I'm not going to get technical, but if you just remember that most atheists that you will find do not believe in God because of they say there is a lack of evidence. Now, all the last. So that's the definition of atheism. Now, the next thing we need to know is that of there is what is called the new atheism. Over the last 15 years, a new group of atheists have become famous. They are aggressive, evangelistic, and pay little attention to the scholarship needed to engage with Christian theologians. The leading new atheists are as follows. Now, I, I, I want to unpack a lot of this stuff, but this is just a basic lecture. I can't unpack all the scholarship required to inform you what i mean by some of these terms i can only give you a little snippet otherwise we'll be here for two three four hours but it says they are aggressive so the new atheists are aggressive it says these are my words they are evangelistic and they pay little attention to the scholarship needed to engage with christian theology so most of these a high-end uh, atheist who are writing books most of them are not equipped to deal with theologians academically uh, on the theologians turf and i'm going to explain that to you now 
So the leading New Atheist are as follows, Richard Dawkins, born in 1941, an evolutionary biologist. Sam Harris, born in April 1967, American author and philosopher and neuro, a neuroscientist. Number three, Christopher Hitchens, a British American author, polemicist, debater, and journalist. Daniel Dennett, born in March 1942, American philosopher, writer, and cognitive scientist. And Michael Onfray, born 1st of January 1959, French writer and philosopher. Now, Dr. Al Muller, uh, an eminent theologian who I respect, says this, and you need to take note of this if you're a Christian. The new atheism is now an established feature of the intellectual landscape of our age. I'll repeat, the new atheism is now an established feature of the intellectual landscape of our age. And uh, Dr. Alan Muller has written a book on atheism. I would encourage you to get hold of that. I think it's called uh, Atheism Remix or something like that. Uh, but if you go to Dr. Alan Muller's website, um, you will find a great blessing. Uh, on his website, uh, he, he's written a number of articles critiquing atheism. So he goes, the new atheism is now an established feature of the intellectual landscape of our age. Uh, atheism has become cool, it's become hip. Years ago, uh, atheists were seen as elderly men uh, in tweed jackets in Cambridge and Oxford who didn't bother anybody. But now, if you notice, these writers are professional in various fields. They've written popular uh, books pr promoting their views and they've taken atheism out onto the streets. Again, it's aggressive, it's evangelistic. Now, just an as a side, and we'll get into this uh, later, uh, just for those who are atheists, who are technical and know a little bit about atheism, these are more the popular atheist writers. Um, there are some academics, atheists, um, if we're much more nuanced and professional and better uh, at dealing with theologians than these writers, but these are the main writers that are high, have a high profile in the media. It's interesting to note that each one of these atheists, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harry, Christopher Hitchens, um, Daniel Dennett, and Mike, Mike Michel Longfrey, they are very poor at, in their scholarship when it comes to dealing with theologians. Um, Dawkins book, The God Delusion, Alvin Plantinga, uh, a Christian philosopher, has noted, and this has been noted not only by him, but by people who are secularist uh, academics, that it, it lacks any depth. Dawkins book lacks depth. And the reason is, and that goes for all these atheist books, they're not actually engaging with other scholars. You see, if you're going to be an academic, you have to quote other scholars and show that you're actually dealing with these scholars. And that's what you don't find when these people move out of their sphere of expertise, i.e. Dennett with cognitive science, cognitive science, uh, the cognitive scientist and Dawkins, the evolutionary biologist, when they move out of their expert fields, and start to speak about Christianity, they don't deal with the theologians and the scholars from the Christian perspective. And, and this, is, uh, this can be seen in the poor quality of the writing of these new atheists. And that's why even the top academics in, in philosophy do not regard these uh, new atheists as significant or important when it comes to critiquing Christianity. Next, I, I want to look at the biblical response to atheism. So the atheist says that they don't believe due to a lack of evidence. So what does God say about the new atheism? If you turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 18, Romans 1, 18. Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So don't forget, the atheist says that there is a lack of evidence for God. 
and God is saying, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who what? Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So the atheist knows what is unrighteous. Sorry, sorry, the atheist knows what the truth is and suppresses that truth, holds it down. The atheist has no excuse, verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. God has shown the truth and they know it. God has given them all the evidence they need. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are what? Without excuse. They are without excuse. And because God has given this knowledge and they reject it, they become fools. Verse 21. Because that which they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. You see, the atheist, from God's perspective, knows that there is a God, has suppressed the truth, and then they become fools, because rather than glorify God, they began to glorify themselves. And so then God gives them over to judgment. Romans 1 22 professing themselves to be wise they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible incorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever amen and i could go on and on for from verse 32 we'll go on for this cause god gave them up unto vile affections for even the woman did change the natural use into that which is against nature and likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in the lust one towards another men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet and even as they did not like to retain god in their knowledge god gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient being filled with all unrighteousness fornication wickedness covetousness maliciousness full of envy murder debate deceit malignity whisperers backbiters haters of god despiteful proud boasters invented of evil things disobedient to parents now the point here is this passage it can be applied not only to atheists it can be applied to anybody who rejects god but it also applies to atheists the biblical response to atheism is that atheists know there is a god they are suppressing the truth and because they suppress the truth they become vain in their imagination and then god judges them and leads them to their own devices and then they go off into more immorality so never ever be hoodwinked by the atheist never think that the atheist has you on the back foot never think that you're the one who has to give a reason all the time they have to give a reason why they reject god why they reject all the evidence for god they will constantly try to make you give an argument for the existence of god but once you give that argument what they will do is knock it down and if you want to knock something down it can be done if you go out with an attitude of negativity you will produce negativity and if an atheist goes out and wants to be negative towards your argument they will be negative and so the atheist wants you to feel as if you're the problem that you can't provide the evidence and you need to make sure that in your mind as a christian that you understand that there is evidence that god has clearly said that creation reveals him creation shows that he exists and um, atheists are suppressing the truth it comes down to this the atheist wants to live 
a life without God. They want to enjoy their life without God. They want to be free from God. They want to be independent from God, just like Adam and Eve wanted to be independent from God. So men and women want to be independent from God. And it's not about the evidence. It's about pride. It's about self-will. It's about immorality. The atheist wants to be proud of himself or herself, proud of her knowledge, proud of her ability, proud of his ability. The atheist wants to be free from God, wants to be free and do their own thing. The atheist wants to live the way they want to live. It's nothing to do about the intellect. It's all to do about the will and it's all to do about the way they live. They want to be free from the constraints of a holy God and they don't want to live a holy life. They want to live in sin and they want to enjoy sin and they want to do that and they don't want to come under the jurisdiction of God. That is God's verdict. That is the biblical response to atheism. They are suppressing the truth. It is a lie that they teach. They are not listening to the word of God. They are actually listening to the doctrines of men. They're listening to men's ideas. They're saying, which we'll get onto in a minute, but they will say to you that they are individualists, that they are not people who follow a, a, a leader. That's what they tell you. But truth be told that that's what they're doing. They are following doctrines of men, men's ideas, men's ways of thinking rather than the word of god rather than what god says they are following the doctrines of men and as they think they are clever they become fools and they become blind and they come under judgment do not be intimidated by this idea that atheists are not getting the evidence that they want because they are they're rejecting it now We've looked at the definition of atheism. We've looked at new atheism. And now I just want to talk about atheism on the streets. I want to equip you as a Christian, as an evangelist, and as an apologist on dealing with atheism on the streets. When you're on the streets, when you're, when, when you're in the mist of real life, whether it be at college, at university, at school, and at workplace or if you're doing evangelism on the streets etc i'm going to equip you now to a number of types of atheists and and how to deal with them so atheism on the streets i'm going to reiterate this again always remember that atheists you meet and this is very important will always pride themselves as individualist so all remember this this is very important always remember that atheists you meet will always pride themselves as individualists most atheists see things the same way but if you was to indicate this they would get offended they claim to have no leaders no doctrine this is what they claim but it is not true okay so let's just unpack that a minute Always remember that atheists you meet will always pride themselves as individualists. They're, when you meet most atheists that you meet will pride themselves on being individualists. That they'll say, well, you can't say that about me. You, you, you're putting me in the same bag as every other type of atheist. But atheism is just a, a simple term. And then everybody just does their own thing. There are different ideas of atheism. And you're being uh, small-minded, narrow-minded, dogmatic. Uh, saying that all atheists are X, Y, Z. That's what they'll say. And so if you make a statement about atheism, they'll say, well, not all atheists are like that. And so it, it kind of, it kind of, what they're doing is it, they're muting your critique of atheism, you see. They're, they're, they're castrating it by doing that. So what you gotta, what you got to do is acknowledge before you even talk to them, as you talk to them, acknowledge that they're an individualist. But the truth is they're not. 
but talk to them as if they are as if their brand of atheism is a a different type of atheism than that they think so you need to respect their attitude about themselves that they feel they're individualist and not to put them in the same back as everybody every other atheist you need to respect you need to show them that respect because if an atheist thinks that you don't understand atheism if you don't understand this issue of individuality you'll you'll put them off so show them respect that you respect their understanding that they are an individualist but the truth be told the truth is that most atheists can come under certain categories so for example most atheists are scientific materialists all right so in other words what that means is you can take general arguments about atheism and apply it to most atheists okay you can do that so it's a bit complicated i understand this is a little bit complicated but it's very important always show the atheist respect to their individualism you see in atheist culture uh you will find as you talk to individual atheists and as you listen to the literature and listen to what they're doing they pride themselves on this individuality so you must at least show respect at least show some understanding of where they're at that they feel that they're individualists they're not following a crowd they're not following a leader they are their own person with their own mind and they've made their own decisions and they've come to their own conclusions about what they believe that's what they want you to think about themselves but what you need to realize is that's not true the fact of the matter fact of the matter is they're following the crowd the fact of the matter is they're following certain ideas that they picked up from some other atheist they've got various ideas from different people and often they're the same ideas the same old arguments that they're rehashing all right okay so now you'll meet four types of atheist on the street first of all you meet the militant atheist they are aggressive and insulting walk away from them from time to time you will meet an atheist that is narrow and dogmatic on the street when you meet these people turn away and do not have anything to do with them and it's the same on the internet don't have anything to do with them you will not get anywhere you'll not achieve anything you'll not get anywhere so don't have anything to do with them second the missionary atheist these atheists will be nice with you but for a reason they want to convert you to atheism so walk away so what happens is you'll be on the streets in a city or a town or a village and you'll be talking to an atheist and they'll seem to be interested but actually they're a missionary atheist they have you in their sights they want to convert you to their atheism so what they're doing is love bombing you like the cults do they love bomb you they they show they they kind of fe make it feel as if they're vulnerable and they need you and they're listening to what you've got to say and they're finding it interesting but actually they're well trained in their arguments against christianity and the what they're doing is trying to break your debt break break your faith and break your break you down and they they'll spend hours talking to you and they'll do it over weeks and weeks and weeks and you think you're talking to an atheist and trying to and they're coming to know jesus but truth be known they're working on you to try to convert you to atheism now these missionary atheists you will have one in every town every city and they will latch on to a to a place where there is evangelism and they will begin to talk with you and they'll begin to take up your time you need to turn away from these turn away from the aggressive ones and turn away from the missionary atheist yeah because you'll not achieve anything talking to them they'll just waste your time thirdly then there is the know-it-all atheist this atheist knows a little about science 
they might they might they're often young people who know a bit about physics and biology and whatever and they're willing to talk with you but they have a superior attitude as if christians uh believing in the flood and whatever it, it's a bit anti-intellectual so these are the know-it-all atheists now you can have a conversation with these people even though they know it alls and they think they know it all you can actually have a conversation with them you can actually dialogue with them you can actually share the gospel with them so engage with them share the gospel share the seed and then finally the man and woman on the street atheist they know a little about atheism but have a variety of reasons why they don't have faith in god in other words they don't know much about dawkins and all these people but they've got various reasons why they don't believe in god either because there's problem of evil because of etc you know um and they've got all sorts of reasons so these are the four kind of atheists that you'll meet you'll meet others uh, in different shades to these but these are just generally four types that you will meet there are other types but if you remember stay away from the militant aggressive ones stay away from the missionary ones talk to the know-it-all ones to know it to the talk, talk to those man on the street atheist you can share the gospel with them okay okay now we're going to get into some um deep stuff now uh as we go into the seminar and into this lecture now we're going to look at uh, arguments against christianity that the atheists use um so you, you need to realize it th this is very very important when you're dealing with an atheist and I, i've got to stress this because it's absolutely important if you're going to tangle with an atheist then you better know what you're up against yeah you better know what you're up against these people even the the pe the atheists that don't know much they will get their arguments, their ideas from the ones that do. And these arguments that they have, they're not designed to play around. These arguments that they have are designed to destroy your faith. So you, you, if you tangle with these kind of people, they will destroy your faith if you are not prepared, if you're not grounded. So the arguments that I'm giving you now are to prepare you against their attacks yeah now most atheists when you talk to an atheist most atheists will attack your faith first of all the first primary attack that they often go for is the old testament and the argument goes like this the god of the old testament is evil they will say that the old testament is full of violence and allows rape etc so they, they, so they go for the Old Testament and they say the Old Testament is full of violence, the slaughtering of children and all the rest of it as Israel goes into the promised land and kills everybody. So if we turn to Genesis 15. So if you go to the Bible, if we go to Genesis 15. Genesis 15. and we look at verse 13 to 16 it says and he said unto abraham no surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years and also that nation whom they shall serve will i judge and afterwards they shall come out with great substance and thou shalt go to the fathers in peace thou shalt be buried in a good old age but in the fourth generation there shall come hither for the iniquity of them amorites is not yet full and it shall come to pass that when it, the sun went down and it was dark behold a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed by those pieces now the lord here is saying to to abraham that he's given the amorites 400 years to repent so basically when god sent in the people of god 
into Canaan and where they destroyed those people, literally destroyed everybody there who was not supposed to be there. God gave those people 400 years. He gave them time to repent. He gave them time to repent. He gave them that time. And these people were doing wicked and vile things. They were killing children. They were slaughtering children. They were doing horrible things. So God was bringing judgment upon those, that na those nations. And he gave them 400 years to repent. The other thing as well, uh, I didn't. This is not in my uh, lecture notes, but it, it's a bit more technical, and this is what I would call nuclear apologetics. But seeing as it's a lecture, I, I can diverge and give some more, more stuff. Basically, when an atheist says to you uh, they don't agree with the Bible, it's got more immoral issues in it, and whatever, you, and and the God of the Bible is evil, and, and all this basically ask them is morality objective or relative now if an atheist says that morality is objective they'll not be able to establish establish that they will not be able to establish that they will say if they do say and not many will say but if they do say that morality is objective that is to say there are absolute moral standards like lying is always wrong etc if they do say that they will find it hard to ground that if not impossible because they will say well morality is objective because uh, society says so but which society you see if you say lying is always wrong because our society says it's wrong well what about a society that says lying is right um so in other words they can't an atheist can't ground morality objectively it can't be done so you get few atheists actually saying that morality is objective but what most atheists will admit is that morality is relative now if morality is relative then why are they judging the old testament as immoral they're using an absolute standard To reject the bible but they have a relative methodology so there's a big contradiction they they're relative in morality they believe in morality is relative but when it comes to attacking the bible they believe morality is absolute so they're not being consistent with their worldview if they truly believe and they do believe that mor morality is relative then what gives them the right to criticize any book or anybody and say that that's right or that's wrong because there is no right there is no wrong it's just relative to whatever cultural context says it says what's right says what's wrong okay so that's a bit more technical philosophically um so then let's go to rape in the bible um the atheist will bring up this verse Deuteronomy 22. Let's read Deuteronomy 22. Deuteronomy 22. Deuteronomy 22, verse 25. Deuteronomy 22, verse 25. But if a man find a betrothed or damsel in the field, and the man forced her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel that shall do nothing, there is a damsel nor sin worthy of death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so this matter, but he found her in the field, and the betrothal damsel cried, and there was none to save her. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, they be found. 
and the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver and she shall be his wife because he hath humbled her he may not put her away all his days so now the atheist says verse 29 28 and 29 teaches that a man if he rapes a woman has to marry the woman and that's the end of that that's the bible teaching the rapist marries the rape victim and that's wrong they forget a couple of things first of all if you back up it's very clear that the atheist uh, that the rapist is is actually when the rapist does a rape is actually um loses their life so why is it that in this context in verse 28 29 the rapist doesn't lose the what those rape doesn't lose um their life and ends up actually marrying the victim why is that well uh, the cultural context there is is this um Averick, uh, sorry uh, rabbi moshi Averick, uh, an orthodox jew says this an orthodox rabbi says this in jewish law woman cannot be forced to marry against her will i'll read it again in jewish law woman cannot be forced to marry against her will so why is it then a jewish rabbi believes and orthodox jews believe that a woman cannot be forced against her will to marry why is it then the atheists read this passage and think that a woman is forced to marry the rape victim uh, the rapist why is it that the atheist reads this text and then the jewish orthodox rabbis read in a different way what's going on here well the reason is the jewish orthodox ra the rabbis know about this verse in exodus 22 if you turn to exodus 22 exodus 22 verse 16 and 17 you shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. Exodus 22, 16 and 17. And if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed and lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. If a father utterly refuse to give her unto him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. So there it quite clearly gives the family the right to reject anybody who wants to marry a daughter um and does it in a, you know it says and if a man entice a maid that is betrothed and lie with her he shall surely endow her to be his wife if her father utterly refused to give her unto him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgin. So here it's quite clear that if, if there is a, a situation where there is unlawful sex, the family can reject the person who is to marry, who wants to marry the man or has to marry the, uh, sorry, the, 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 the family can reject the man who wants to marry the woman so when god what god was doing in the deuteronomy text is this is basically in that day if a woman was raped or assaulted and they they were not married they would lose their their livelihood they would be seen ashamed they would have no hope they would have nothing in that society so basically the rapist would have to look after the woman and provide for the woman if the woman was willing so obviously what that means is that's not the kind of rape of uh, a man just going into a village and attacking a woman it's obviously the same as verse 16 in exodus and if a man entice a maid 
that is not betrothed and lie with her he shall surely endow her to be his wife so in other words it's not the same as what we would understand as rape it's not the same so what that's what he's saying is that when there's an enticement of a woman and there can be an opportunity that's there has to be an opportunity for that man to provide for that woman if he's taking her dignity because he's taking her livelihood he's taking everything from her but the family don't have to accept that and so the accusation that the atheist says that the bible teaches that a uh, 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 says that rape's okay is just completely bogus and false and that was down to the fact that they didn't read the context of the passage before and the context of exodus and that's why the rabbinic jews say as rabbi moshi Averick, orthodox rabbi says in jewish law woman cannot be forced to marry against her will so I know that was technical and I know it was difficult to to get a grasp on but atheists will attack your faith with these kind of arguments and you have to be aware that they're not messing about they're here to pull your faith down they're here to try and destroy you and you need to be ready also when the atheist attacks the Old Testament always get back to Christ always get back to him in John 3 16 God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Always get back to the big picture of why the Old Testament was given. This so-called violent God that you're talking about, atheists, about God going in and, and telling the Israel to kill everybody. This same God, you know, came down in human flesh and died on a cross. So get back to that. Talk about that. Talk about Christ and why the Old Testament was given. Because that's not what they want you to talk about, but that's what you need to talk about. The next thing, um, the next argument that atheists will, will come against is argument two. Why do Christians eat shellfish? When the Old Testament says not to do so. So turn to Leviticus 11. Leviticus 11. Leviticus 11 Leviticus 11 Nevertheless these shall not eat of them that chew the cud or of them that divide the hoof as the camel because he cheweth the cud but divideth not the hoof he is unclean unto you Then he goes to verse 7 and the swine, though he divide the hoof and clove the foot, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean to you. So there are these kind of laws about what to eat, what not to eat. And the atheists will say, well, why don't we obey these Old Testament laws? You're not being consistent as a Christian. And the atheist basically doesn't understand the Bible, doesn't understand or they don't understand what is called the new covenant and the old covenant the old covenant and the new covenant turn to jeremiah 31 jeremiah 31 jeremiah 31 jeremiah 31 and and most atheists if not all atheists that i've met i mean i have to say this i've said this before but i've talked to thousands of atheists and i could tell you now i've never ever met one not one atheist not one who's ever know knows what they're quoting they've never ever been able ever i've never met one that's ever been able to give me an a bible quote and tell me the context the atheists do not know how to do exegesis. They only know how to do eisegesis. They only know how to pull Bible verses out of context. They don't know how to do Bible study. Okay. <clears throat> so Jeremiah 31, 
31 and 34. <coughs> Excuse me. Behold, the days come, said the Lord, I will make what? A new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. <coughs> Not according to the covenant that I made with the fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, break, though I was a husband unto them, said the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make that with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my law in the inward parts and write it on their hearts and will be their god and they shall be my people <coughs> so the lord says there will be a new covenant in jeremiah where the law will be written what in their hearts did you get that so here here when we see in the old testament it is the old covenant about the laws of how we eat and god says i will give you a new covenant which will be in the heart not about the way you eat eat but the way you worship god from the heart so turn to 2 corinthians chapter 3 verse 6 so the reason why we don't have these laws of eating is because they're not part of the new covenant 2 corinthians 3 6 and i could give many other reasons but this will suffice for now uh, 2 corinthians chapter 3 verse 6 <coughs> excuse me he says, who has made us, un notice this, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, who also has made us, what, able ministers of what, the new covenant, the new testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. You see, the Old Testament laws for food were of the letter, they were the old ways but now we have the spirit that gives life. We have the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Who have also made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. The spirit giveth life. It, you see, the new covenant is about the Holy Spirit. It's not about regulations. It's not about how we eat. It's about our hearts. It's about the heart being united with God through the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not in my notes, but I'm just going to say this. This is just extra notes for those who are interested. You can also say to the atheist, and it gets a bit more technical, but you can say not only is it the new covenant, that's why we don't have these Old Testament laws about food, but also there are you have to understand the nature of law in the Old Testament. There are a variety or types of laws. There is the moral law, that is the Ten Commandments. Now, these mor the moral law, the Ten Commandments, is forever. It, it, it is for all time. Then you have the ceremonial law, which is part of the Old Covenant. And the ceremonial laws are not for today, and those are the meats. And then you have national laws, that is for the nation of Israel, that are not apl apl applicable to us uh, in the New Testament and that's more of a technical answer to the question why we don't have eat those foods in the Old Testament um, but uh, a more simplified answer would be to read 2 Corinthians 3 6 and Jeremiah chapter 31 31 to 34 and talk about the new covenant argument three the next argument atheists will use against you is why does God let evil and suffering in the world? They will say suffering and evil came in. So suffering and evil is here. Look at all these people dying. Look at all these people who've not asked for it. They will often use emotional arguments. Their apologists often do this. And you'll find it when you're on the streets. They will give you an example. They will tell you about a baby that's died in hospital that they know or, or some personal story. And they'll pull on your heartstrings. And basically, it's not an argument, it's an emotional argument. And so they will try to browbeat you with this. So how do you answer? Well, let us turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. <coughs> let 
Romans 5 verse 12 wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned how did sin come into the world by one man sin entered into the world so Adam and Eve committed sin and that's how suffering and evil came into the world okay basically the exercise free will now i've heard technical philosophers atheist philosophers i mean top of the range academic philosophers and i've heard some of the more intellectual atheists uh, on youtube scoff and laugh at this argument about free will but what they don't what they don't realize it's actually a very good argument the reason why it's a good argument is it's, it's because of the nature and i put this the nature of the case you see christianity and this is very important is rooted in the trinity a lot of apologists and a lot of atheists forget this M most atheists forget this and most christian apologists forget this that christianity is rooted in the trinity that's our first starting point we start with the trinity now in the trinity is father son and holy spirit and these three are one and within that within the trinity there is a loving relationship so when God made human beings, he made us in relationship to love. To be in relationship with each other and to be in relationship with God. And this requires free will. You cannot have a loving relationship without free will. Otherwise, you'd be a robot. And you can't have love with a robot. So it required God to make human beings free and that's why when they were made free they were also free to fail they were free to make mistakes okay but basically free to choose a relationship to choose a relationship with each other to choose a relationship with god <coughs> and philosophers can scoff and some of these clever atheists can scoff but it is a very consistent argument because it relates specifically to our understanding of who we are in god that there is a trinitarian god now but we don't stop at that we we, we don't stop at that because you can also say to the atheist look if i give you a philosophical answer to the problem of evil to the problem of suffering will that solve it if for example some families who have had people die um, in the concentration camps and I had some of the family members here and we were able to give them a philosophical answer to the problem of evil would that be okay and the answer is no why because that family would those families would still be suffering and uh, because of the lost loved ones and so God did not give and does not give a philosophical answer to the problem of evil. What God does, he gives a practical answer. He, he practically deals with it. And we see it here. In John chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning all things were made by him without him was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men yeah verse 14 and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth so what what god did is he came down in human flesh and he died on a cross for our sin and he dealt at the heart the root of suffering and evil by dealing with it head on by giving himself as a sacrifice and taking your punishment for your sin it was not a philosophical answer it was a practical answer God demonstrated his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The 
But before, uh, argument four, science is all we need and it has proven Christianity is false. This is one of the big arguments that atheists use. Science is all we need and it was proven Christianity is proven Christianity is false. First of all, in response to this, atheists are guilty of scientism. Scientism is the idea that the only knowledge that matters is scientific knowledge. And most atheists are guilty of this. But science is not the be all and end all of all knowledge. There is music, there is art, there is poetry. There are things that science can't explain. So science is good, but it can't tell you from right, from wrong, or the meaning of life. So always remember when you're talking to an atheist, to get them to acknowledge that science is good, but it doesn't answer everything. It's also limited. And many atheists are propagating what is called scientism, which is, uh, is not correct. Secondly, Christianity has been at the heart of helping, helping science to develop. Nicholas Copernicus in 1475 to 1543, Sir Francis Bacon in 1561 to 1627, Galileo in 1564 and 1642, René Descartes 1596 to 1650, Blaise Pascal 1623 to 1662, Isaac Newton 1642 and 1727, Michel Farad, Michael Faraday 1791 to 1867, all these men had faith in God of the Bible, all of them had a great impact on science. And I have to say this, that if you actually look at the history of science, even back into the early Middle Ages, there were uh, bishops claiming that people do science, encouraging people to do science. And it was actually, you know, there is a myth that has been invented by atheists to propagate their ideas. And the myth is concerning Galileo and also uh, Bishop Wilberforce, uh, Galileo, 1564 to 1642. Uh, it is stated that the Catholic Church stopped, it, tried to stop him from doing his theories about astronomy. Actually, the truth be told is, if you look into the facts, it was a couple of issues. One, Aristotelian philosophy. Aristotle's philosophy got into the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church applied that Aristotelian philosophy. Uh, some parts of the Catholic Church, for, ex for example, some of the Jesuits, and that impeded scientific inquiry because scientific inquiry is about having a hypothesis and testing it, testing it by experience, not just uh, hypothetical, logical, um, logical uh, frameworks and various types of logical constructions. And so it was that that was impeding Galileo. It was not specifically the Catholic Church, but it was the some of the theologians and thinkers that had imbibed Aristotelian philosophy. Secondly, it was also the Pope. The Pope said to Galileo, look, if you write your book, don't mention my name and don't mock me. And Galileo agreed to this. But Galileo and the Pope were not the best of friends. And it came about that Galileo, when he got his book published, the censors allowed it to be published because they thought he got an okay from the Pope. But when the Pope read the book and when people began to read the book, they were shocked to find that he insulted the Pope. And so Galileo was stopped by Aristotelian philosophy and secondly, because he, had, he was unwise in the way he dealt with the Pope. And there was a personality clash between the Pope and Galileo. It was nothing to do with the Catholic Church being anti-scientific. Because there were also many in the Catholic Church, theologians, that did agree with Galileo. But this is an example of how atheists can take historical situations and spin them to try and promote their atheism. Another example is William Wilberforce. Uh, sorry, Wilberforce, Bishop Wilberforce. 
Now, Bishop Wilberforce uh, debated a guy called Huxley <coughs> at the time of Charles Darwin when his theory of evolution began to be developed and was put into the public air. Now, there is a mythology that's been created that apparently Huxley, according to the atheist and popular culture today, that uh, Wilberforce, Bishop Wilberforce, lost the debate and Huxley was triumphant. It was science over religion. But actually, if you look into the history of that debate, Wilberforce, Bishop Wilberforce, wrote a 50-page paper, a very scholarly piece of paper, and he sent it to Darwin, and Darwin was extremely impressed by the critical analysis of this bishop. Secondly, in the debate, there was not much mentioned at the end of it because it was seen as a draw. It was only a few days later that Huxley began to manipulate the press and write about it as if he was the victor and created a myth so that it would be promoting uh, Darwinian evolution. Again, um, the facts, the historical facts twisted to suit the atheist agenda. So we've looked at, at Christianity, at, at science there, scientism, we've looked at the scientific method that many scientists of the past were actually Christians, even in the Middle East, uh, yeah, were, were Christian based and focused in the, in the scientific inquiry. And you can go back even into the early Middle Ages where science was being developed by bishops who believed in the empirical method. The next thing I want to say is the more we know about physics, chemistry and biology, the more it points to a God. So as we develop in our scientific knowledge, this does not go against Christianity, but also but confirms it. Paul Davis, astrophysicist, says the laws of physics seem to be the product of exceedingly ingenious design. The universe must have had a purpose. Now, Paul Davis is not a Christian, but he recognizes there is some design within the universe. Alan Sandage, winner of the Crawford Prize in Astronomy, says, I find it quite improbable that such order came out of chaos. There has to be some organizing principle god to me is a mystery but it is the explanation for the miracle of existence why there is something instead of nothing so as we look at creation as we look at the knowledge that we're gaining in biology in psychology in chemistry wherever it's confirming that there is a designer it's not going against the christian faith it's confirming it argument five religion has caused wars and killed millions of people, said the atheist. However, in fact, more people have died under atheist regimes than all the Christianity or religion of wars of throughout history. Over 50 million people people died under Mao Mao Zedong uh, of China, and maybe 50 million. Uh, of Joseph Stalin. Now the atheist will say, ha, well, these weren't real atheists, but if you read the papers, you read the articles of these uh, people of St Stalin, they were promoting what they were doing under the banner of atheism. Jesus also taught, just an aside here, that we should love one another. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 and 46, we turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. So even all this violence that we see throughout history is not according to Jesus' teaching. If you turn to Matthew 5, 43. Matthew 5, 43. It says, you have heard that it has been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them and cur that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which spitefully use you and persecute you. So here the Lord is saying, look, love your enemies. In Luke chapter 10, verse 30, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke 10. Luke 
Luke 10, verse 30. Jesus answered, A certain man went down to Jericho, Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was and when he saw him he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds pouring on in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to the an inn and took care of him and on the morrow when he departed he took out two pence and gave them to the horse and said unto him take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more when i come again i will repay thee which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves so there the Lord is teaching the Good Samaritan there. And so whenever the atheist says, or oh, look at the violence in throughout history of religion, just point them out that Jesus' teaching was about loving uh, enemies, uh, about giving up your power to serve the weak and helping the vulnerable, etc. And so whoever's gone in the name of violence throughout history, they're not going in the name of the teaching of Jesus. Okay, so I've given you there, I've given you there some of their arguments. So I give you um, Excuse me. So I've given you um, a feel for the kind of attacks on your faith, the kind of nuances that they come in, come with, and I've given you some ideas and um, some ways of trying to tackle these questions that they bring up. Um, the fact that you're prepared, that the fact that you know about these questions, the fact that I've told you these is a preparation in itself so that you're ready for whenever they come come at you. And when you're in school, college, university, wherever you are, you will get uh, one of these atheists spreading their ideas, missionizing, doing missionary work, trying to spread their atheism in the school, in the university. And if you are prepared, if you know these things, then you know how to deal with them if you get an opportunity to talk to people in your class or in your student union you're, you're equipped then to to deal with them <coughs> now let's turn to act 17 so we're going to look now at mars hill apologetics and basically this is the apostle paul's methodology for dealing with sophisticated thinkers so let's look at acts chapter 17 verse 16 to 29. Mars Hill Apologetics. Now, while Paul was waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. When he saw the city wholly given to idolatry, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him, and some said, what will this babbler say? And others some, he seemed to be setting forth strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus saying, may we know what the new doctrine wherein thou speakest? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all these things you are too superstitious. For as I have passed by and beheld your devotions, I have found an altar with this 
inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. God, that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worship with man's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And had made of one blood and all nations of men, for to dwell on the face of the earth, and have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Happily they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device, at the time of this ignorance God winked at, but now commendeth all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he had ordained, wherein he had gained assurance unto all men, and they, they had raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him, and believed among them which was Didymus and Arba, uh, Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So here we're looking at Mars Hill apologetics. Yeah, Mars Hill apologetics. First of all, creation. Verse 16. Paul's apologetic method to these sophisticated philosophers. If you Google Stoics, if you Google Epicurus, Epicureans, you will find these have a rich, long, historical, intellectual tradition. The Epicureans had a very eminent intellectual tradition. The Stoics had a very eminent intellectual tradition. But Paul doesn't get bogged down in philosophy. He starts with three things, creation, conscience, and Christ. Acts 17, 16. Now, what, so... We go to um, let's go to uh, verse twenty four. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that He is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. So Paul goes straight first of all to creation. He tackles the philosophers about creation. He says, "Look, you know there's a God. Look at creation." And so we have to point people to creation. Creation speaks of God. Dr. George Johnston says this about DNA. DNA in the cell has information. And he says human DNA contains more organized information than the Encyclopedia Britannica. In the full text of the Encyclopedia were to arrive in a computer code from outer space, most people would regard this as a proof of the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence. But when seen in nature, it is explained by Darwin's Darwinist as the workings of random forces. Jonathan Wells, the secret of DNA success is that it carries information like that of a computer program. But far more advanced since experience shows that intelligence is the only presently cause of information. We can infer that intelligence is the best explanation for the information in DNA. It's a cast iron, cast iron argument. The cast iron are uh, cast it's just a brilliant argument and um i would encourage you to think about it uh go and read uh john lennox god's undertaker if you want more information about the argument about creation from dna secondly conscience uh paul tackles the philosophers with their conscience uh act 17 verse 30 to 31 now notice, notice this, he's tackling sophisticated thinkers, and yet he says this, Acts 17, 30, 31, At the time of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. 
because why he had appointed a day in which he will what judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he had ordained therein he had given assurance unto all men that he had raised him from the dead we'll get on to that in a minute but he has appointed a day in which he will what judge the world paul is talking about morality is talking about the need to repent the judgment day and if you turn to Galatians 3.24, Galatians 3.24, Galatians 3.24, Wherefore the law was our what? Schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might what? Be justified by faith. The law brings people to Christ if we quote the Ten Commandments and ask people what do you think of them have you signed have you lied have you stolen have you committed adultery etc etc we we bring the Ten Commandments to people's minds the Holy Spirit will use that to prick their conscience to show them their sin and drive them to Christ who will then cleanse them and forgive them as they believe on him but Paul starts with creation then he moves into conscience when we're talking to atheist let's get back on the gospel get back on the ten commandments and no matter how sophisticated they are get back on the ten commandments and let the holy spirit prick their conscience through those ten commandments charles spurgeon says until men know the law their crimes have it least as a palation of partial ignorance but when the cord of rules is spread before them, when the cord of rules is spread before them, their offense becomes even greater. And then finally, Paul not only does creation, not only does conscience, but then he does the resurrection. He talks about the resurrection of Christ. If you look at um, Acts 17, 32, Acts 17, 32, Acts 17:32 When they heard of the resurrection of the dead they mocked and others said we will hear again of this matter so Paul preached to them the resurrection and the philosophers considered it some got converted some rejected but Paul talked about evidence of the resurrection Now I have to say this and this is important that the evidence for the resurrection is there that the atheist haven't got a leg to stand on when it comes to denouncing the resurrection that when you come to the resurrection we have the evidence I'm just going to read this and, and unpack this why this is the case this is Josephus. Now there was about this time, Josephus was a Jewish historian who wrote in 60 AD and who came from Galilee. And he wrote this about Jesus. Now there was about this time, Jesus a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was... The Christ and when Pilate at the suggestion of the principal men among us had condemned him to the cross those that loved him at the first did not forsake him for he appeared to them alive again the third day as the divine prophets had foretold these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him and the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day antiquities 1830 1833 Josephus now uh, Vermes who is who recently died he was a world authority on um, the Dead Sea Scrolls says that there are three kind of groups of scholars on this passage there are those scholars and who, who say that all this is genuine Josephus that Josephus says historically that jesus died and rose again this is a jewish historian who was not a believer says that jesus died and he rose again 
Vermez also says there are the majority of scholars in the middle who say that this Josephus passage has been interpolated. That means to say that there are some parts such as appear to them the third day, divine prophets, etc. These things have been interpolated. That is to say that someone has put them in in the third century AD and it's not genuine Josephus. But the stuff about Jesus dying under Pontius Pilate is genuine Josephus. And then Vermeer says that there is a small minority of scholars who say it's not at all Josephus. So you have a small minority that say it's all Josephus genuine. You have a, a small minority say that it is not Josephus. And then you have the vast majority of scholars in the middle that say it's, genu it's genuine Josephus up to a point. There has been some kind of interpolation in some parts. But if we go for the majority of scholars, it's still strong evidence about certain things about Jesus, that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, that he was uh, a miracle worker, etc. So, so what I'm trying to teach you here is that we can provide historical data to confirm the general story about Jesus. We have that evidence. And it's powerful evidence. Now, the atheists will attack these sources, will attack Josephus, will attack um, these historical sources. But they still stand. They are solid evidences for Christianity and prove the veracity, the faithfulness of the New Testament for being an honest book about who Jesus is. I could go into more stuff about the resurrection, but I just want to say that as you learn more evidences for the resurrection, you can use this in your apologetics, and it's powerful stuff, and the atheists don't know much about these topics. They're not well-trained, and if even if they are well-trained, the evidence is so overwhelming against them, you will win the debates and discussions every time. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15. One Corinthians fifteen. One Corinthians fifteen it says, "Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you also you received, wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which also I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again." On the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen of cephas then of the twelve and after that he was seen above 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present but some are fallen asleep so he paul says he's received this of first importance and most scholars will tell you that this is early historical source material that goes within a couple of years of jesus's uh, death uh, and we believe resurrection but it tells you that jesus the early church believed very early on about jesus death and resurrection and it's good historical source material okay and the atheists don't want you to know that okay so we've come to our final part and then um, I'm going to send uh, invitations out to, in fact, I will do that now.
just sending invitations out to a few folk if, if they're around. I don't think they're around. But... think anybody's going to be around but you never know Okay, I've sent a few invitations out. Sorry about that. And uh, so we might get someone, we might not. Um, yeah. I. Um, So I've sent uh, a few invitations out. I don't know if I'll, I'll get anybody, but anyhow, I'll see if anyone comes. <clears throat> hey, Tom, Tommy. Hello. Hello. Hello, Tom. Tommy, can you hear me, mate? Hello. Hello. I can't hear you, Tom. I don't know if you're speaking, Tommy. Hey. Hey. Hey, how you doing, Jason? Hey, bro. How are you doing, mate? Doing, doing good. How are you? All the better for seeing you, bro. Yeah, yeah. It's good to see you, too. So what's happening? I, I've just given a, a seminar on uh, Christianity and atheism. Okay. And uh, I've just finished. Uh, I've just got three pit bits left, and, um, and then after that, I just was gonna. I just sent it to some of the guys that we know who we who we trust. Who we're not gonna spoil it or just. Be <laughs> yeah. So I, I sent it to Arcane, to Empiricism, G Man, 
but I've sent it on on uh, Skype to them. Uh, they weren't on Skype, so I don't know if anyone else will come on. But so is this a new um, sort of a um, series that you're doing, or it's kind of a one-time thing, or it's just the one thing. I I've been leading the mission this week, uh, and the week before we did some preparation. I was asked to do a seminar on atheism. So I did this like seminar thing and I thought I'll do it as a lecture tonight so I've just like done this lecture thing and uh, so it's just a one-off really but it, it's like a culmination of years of uh, interacting with atheists and I've just reduced it to an hour or, or so. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I mean, my experience is there's they're kind of they're two, there's two different animals. There's the the animal that I used to be, and and I guess I really consider myself an atheist in the past. I was more of an I don't careist sort of deist sort of kind of person. But anyway, as I see it, there's there's two kinds. One is the activist atheist who really dislike Christians. Yeah. And then there's the other type who they're you know they they really just don't think about it too much. They don't care. They're distracted by the world. And so, you know, you know, so it's it's kind of a different animal depending on who you're dealing with. You know, it's kind of a different approach. And so that's one thing I kind of kind of learned as I got into this with these guys that there's there's just and and you know there's just such a wide differences in, in in these in these atheists. And I think some of them have some hope, and some of them I'm not I'm not so sure. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why? Why is words, mate? Yeah. I, I totally agree. I, I when I started this lecture, I, I, I gave four examples, but it could be summed up in two. What you just said, four types of atheists, but it comes down mm -hmm. to, like you said, really. Um, the reason why I'm not showing is because I'm, I'm pretty tired, and if people see me now, I might, might I'm ready to flag, because I've been <laughs> busy all day. So that's why I've got this picture up, mate. So it's not, I'm not hiding from you. Oh, that's okay. Uh, I've got, I've got just a few things I'd like to say, and and then I just wondered if you'd make a comment on each one of them. Uh, okay, I'll try. <laughs> it's basically, logical fallacies, fallacies, and tips on debate with atheists. So I'll just go through them. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the the logical fallacies. I'm probably not real strong on, but I can try. There's a, I've got eight things here. It'll only take a couple of minutes, and then if you could like. Give us your take on some of these things. Uh, okay. When an atheist makes a claim, ask them to give you evidence. Ask for a peer review article. Most atheists will not be able to back up the claim they have made. Do you, do you want to say anything about that? Well, of course, it depends on what, what you're talking about, which, which subject. Um, I mean, the, the, the way I see it, I mean, atheism, there's, there's no positive claim. It's all it is is, is, is a, a disbelief in something, in something that somebody else believes. So I don't see how there can be a positive. There, there is no actual position that they hold, so it's kind of hard for them to post anything positive-wise, evidence-wise for their position. So, you know, I, you know but, you know, fair is fair. I mean, it would kind of depend on what, what the issue is. Yeah, yeah, I I agree with you there. But when like when you're talking to them, like if they mention evolution or if they mention something in physics or whatever, you, most of the atheists that I've ever met, if I if I turn around to them, like last week uh, at university, much university, I was talking to physic physics students. I turn around, and say, have you got a peer review article for that? Uh, 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 um, <laughs> they they couldn't give it me. No, well, I mean that's very, very common. I mean, they if you if you hold their their feet to the fire, their evidence that's in their minds that they believe in wholeheartedly. Yeah. But when you when you actually put them to task and tell them to okay present that specific paper or that specific data, um, then it's almost it's almost always an appeal to authority, and it's like they 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 have in their heads that all the biologists believe this, so it must be true. Um, you know, especially when it comes to fossils, when it comes to examples of evolution, I mean, they all fizzle. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's very common, and um, a lot of their a lot of their evidence is really in their mind. It's nothing actual, uh, you know, any actual experiments that they can point you to. Yeah. So yeah, I would definitely agree with that. 
especially with evolution now. I'm 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 not near as or well versed at all in, in most of the other top you know, like physics and chemistry and so I can't speak on those on those topics. But as far as evolution I can you're right on in that in that regard. Thanks, Bob. Um, the next issue is changing the subject. Often you'll be asked a question, but the person will change the subject just as you reply. They do this to confuse you. Get back to what you was talking about. In other words, they'll ask you a question about something. You start to answer it as you're answering mm -hmm. it and get into the grips of the topic. They suddenly change the topic. Mm -hmm. And uh, so to keep them back on track, say, well, you yeah. have a question. Let me ask. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's a it's a it's a classic misdirection, and, and it goes the other way too. They're 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 not very good with direct questions. So if you ask them a very direct question that that requires a direct answer, yeah, yeah, you know, yes or no, and even a yes or no question, you know, they 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 find those very difficult to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, they they they, they do that. They they if they don't want to answer something, or if the conversation is going in the wrong direction. They very hastily change the direction so that they can get on more, you know, firm footing for them, or so they think. Brilliant. Thanks, mate. That was good. Next one is what you mentioned: appeal to authority. Often, an atheist will say, "Science says," or "This scholar says." If the atheist provides no evidence, it's a bad argument. It's from authority. Any thoughts? You've said it already, but yeah, I would say that's the. Really, honestly, I think that's their number one tactic. It's the appeal to authority, and they do it constantly. And the, here's, here's the funny thing. They can never, you know, they'll say, well, why do 99% of the biologists believe in this evolution? Well, A, they've not presented any evidence that that's true. They don't know what the biologists think. And B, they don't even know what a, well, they don't even know what evolution is. They don't know what the definition of it is, and they certainly don't know what all those 99% of those biologists uh, think that de the definition of evolution is. So, you know, evolution, th that term can mean 15 different, you know, 15 or 20 different definitions of it, and who knows what, you know, what who thinks. So, you know, they, they, it's a constant thing that they do, just like that, where they, they appeal to authority and they just, uh, they try to make you believe that what they think biologists think is true. Yeah, yeah. So it's a classic trick. It's, it's all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Next one, attacking the person. Often the atheist will attack you or a Christian scholar or a Christian group with unkind words. They might say, creationists are stupid. This is a mm -hmm. person and is a bad argument. Yeah, I mean, man... I <laughs> I know you and I are in the same boat. I mean, I get the same garbage mm. constantly. You know, it's it's really it's really sad. I, in fact, I got one today. I'm not going to say who it was, but it was really a horrible comment uh, by an atheist who was responding to that video that I made. Mm. You know, um, I was going to read some of it. It's really it's really horrific. Um, I'm looking at it here. I'm trying to figure out what I can read out of it, but you know, it's MF or uh, hope you die. Uh, just yeah, I'm not gonna read it. I'm not gonna read it. But yeah, you know, you know how it is. Yeah. And so it, it's really, you know, it's it's sad that even though they're atheists, you you just it's it's hard to believe that people that that humanity can be that that disgusting, you know, and 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 like. Like I said before with your videos, I mean, I've never heard you say anything negative about a person personally. Um, not that it's not happened. I mean, we all have our moments. But nothing would, would rise to that that you've ever said would rise to the, you know, the comments that you get in return. And, and likewise, I mean, I, I, mean I, I fully admit that I'm, I'm kind of – sometimes I, I, I say things to get a rise out of people. And um, it's one of my faults that that I freely admit, but it's one of my personality traits that I wish I could sometimes alter. But even so, usually my my comments, even if they're designed to get a rise out of people, they're not personal. They're not. I, I don't attack people personally and call them names generally. 
So, but but you know what I get in return is 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 off is often really horrible. So you know you know how it is. Yeah, the and the trying to demean you. I, I don't know if I am um, much interaction off the internet, but like if you if you talk to people off the internet, they will. Oh, oh, they will say, "Oh well, uh, Matt Slick doesn't know what he's talking about," or they'll mm -hmm. say things like that. And and um, mm -hmm. yeah, at the end of the day, you know, they, they just don't give any decent arguments on, and evidence. And well, and I, I would just like to uh, add to what I was saying a second ago. Generally, they are nicer on video, on camera. Yeah, yeah, and and as opposed to on chat. Now on chat, chat is really what I was kind of referring to. That's where they really can get nasty. Yeah, yeah. But on camera, they're they're a little they're a little better behaved. So I will give, and and I would I will say most of the atheists that I come in contact with are are decent, seem to be decent people, and and don't really you know cause a problem. So I don't, I don't want to paint the whole crowd by any means. Yeah. With that broad of a brush, but there are there are you know a segment of that group that that are really kind of nasty. Yeah, yeah, I would I would totally agree with that. I'm I'm what I meant is more um, even the nicer ones can often be a bit uh, have certain views about certain apologists, and, but and when they say things, they're not actually dealing with the apologist argument. They just they've just got. The wrong attitude towards apologies, rather. Well, you know, yeah. I mean, well, I, I guess my my experience is sometimes you can say so, say something that that sort of um, it, it 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 kind of taps into something internal with them that that sets something off. That's really uh, you know it's a sensitive area, and it it just taps into some anger, and so it it wouldn't even have to be. You know anything. I mean, it it can be said in the in the nicest of ways, or you know, you know something you could say that that doesn't seem to you like it's like it's meant to harm them or to upset them or anger them, but for whatever reason, it it slips in there in their in their heart and their soul, and it really makes them angry. It, it touches a nerve, so to say, mm. and so that that happens quite a bit too. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, mate. Next one, number five, a golden rule. Always stay calm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. You know, if you if you like discussing on the streets and evangelizing, and you get into a debate with them, or on the internet or wherever, just keep keep calm, and mm -hmm. win, you win the argument by often by just staying calm because if they lose the right or you know, so that that's my advice when I'm when I've been talking on the streets, we can get into heated debates. But if you can keep calm, then that's half the problem. Yeah, yeah, that's a good rule. And and I, you know, I, I guess I'm I just the way I made up. I, I'm very pretty much a calm person on the outside. Inside, I'm kind of an anxious mess. But generally, I I can kind of keep my calm. Now I, I you know can have my buttons buttons pushed too. Mm. Um, so but but that's that's definitely a good rule. And. It's easier said than done for some people. Some people, you know, they just have kind of an inclination to lash out, and yeah. since someone says something stupid, it's <laughs> you want to just you know, shut up, <laughs> you know. But <laughs> if you don't know the answer, just uh, we'll have to get back to you on that one. You know, sometimes you might not know the answer, but it's not it's not wrong, or nothing to be ashamed of to say. Well, I'll get back to you on that. I'll do some. Work. Yeah. Well, you know, the, to me, this is maybe not exactly what you're talking about, but to, you know, the, as a Christian, as a creationist, there are just some things we're not going to know because we don't, you know, you can't ever prove a past miracle. There, it's not scientific. No. Um, and and I I celebrate mysteries in life, so uh, it, it seems like the other side really doesn't like mystery, but. You know they like they like they like to at least play like science either knows it or their next favorite thing is to say science is working on it, which somehow gives them a you know a sense of comfort on the inside which I don't understand. But to me, if, if you look at something under a microscope or or something far out in space and it's just mesmerizing, I mean I, I celebrate that. I celebrate the mystery of, of how it was formed and 
you know, the mystery of the wonder of God's, you know, miraculousness and, and beauty and, and all the things, you know, that nature can show us about him. Mm. So, yeah, so I'm not afraid at all to, to admit to not knowing stuff or, you know, just admitting, hey, it's a mystery. Uh, I, I love it. It's, it's a great thing. Mm. That's great, mate. Um, next one, uh, keep to the big picture. Talk about who and why Jesus came. So, mm. just a thought there. Man, boy, if <laughs> if I need to heed something, it's that, for absolute for sure. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> that that says it all. I can't really add much to it. I mean, that's it's something I've I've tried to work on myself with. I, I'm just not for whatever reason, and I'm trying to work on it. I'm just not. I'm I'm a very uh, talking about my personal life, my my inner feelings in my heart, just for whatever reason, comes a little bit difficult for me. And so, you know, on camera, um, it's easy for me, or it's just a situation where I, you know, I guess I'm afraid I'm going to say something wrong, or I'm going to get something wrong about the Bible, or come up short uh, on an explanation or be exposed as, you know, biblical idiot. I mean, so it's it's one of those things where there's a fear in me a little bit of getting into that. And it's just it's something I'm trying to work through and kind of, you know, mm -hmm. you know, it, and, I, and I know that would come with, with more knowledge of, of the Bible. And it's, you know, I read the Bible almost every night. So it's not that I don't read it. It's just I probably don't read it in a way that, um, I don't. I don't know how to say it, but I mean, I don't read it in a way that I, I'm. I'm trying to learn so that I can debate somebody. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um. But yeah, I mean, all eyes need to be on Jesus for sure. Yeah. The the other stuff is honestly, it's inconsequential. I mean, it's interesting and it's fun to to debate sometimes, but it's really <laughs> to yeah. me that's it's it's inconsequential. Amen. And if in doubt, go back to the three C's. If in doubt, go back to the three C's. In the lecture that I gave, I talked about in Acts chapter 17, Paul goes up to the Mars Hill, uh, the philosophers on Mars Hill, the Epicureans. And the you all right? Yeah, go ahead. And... Um, so these are two sophisticated philosophical groups, and when he goes up, he deals with them in th with three ways, the three C's, creation, conscience, and Christ. He talks about there's a creation, and th this speaks of God. Mm -hmm. He talks about conscience, he talks about repentance, and, and so he's not mucking about, he's not getting uh, bogged down with philosophy, he's just saying you need to repent. Mm-hmm. Thirdly, he talks about Christ. He talks about the resurrection, um, and so, you know, creation. There are good arguments from creation, like um, the information in DNA. There's conscience. We can quote the Ten Commandments and let the Holy Spirit use that to convict people, and we can uh, talk about Christ, who he is, that he died, rose again, and the historical evidence for that. And uh, so, if we if we get bogged down, or we they try to get us into these rabbit, rabbit um, holes where they take us down all these philosophical questions and we wonder where we're going, what's happening. We can always pull back to the three C's, get back to creation, conscience, and Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, just, I don't know what you think of that. Well, yeah, I mean, absolutely agree. I mean, it seems like those three areas they they like to attack all those, especially with the creation. It's it's funny because it's amazing on these hangouts with these atheists that how often do they start just you know they start talking about evolution, even though they're atheists and even though um, the topic isn't. I mean, evolution doesn't necessarily disprove God, but it's just amazing how that seems to be a favorite topic of them to bring up mm. and really harp on because – and I think it's because if they can somehow bring up questions in people's minds about how it got here, 
that it disqualify or it dis um, uh, what's the word um, uh, kind of pulls kind of pulls the rug out of, of, of uh, underneath the Bible and of God. Mm. And it's a slippery slope, you know. I think they know, and I think that's why the topic of evolution is, you know, brought up all the time. Yeah, yeah. Even though, even though ultimately it is about Christ, it is about you know God, it is about the, the the word of God. But but they use evolution as kind of a sledgehammer. Yeah, yeah. That's weird. Because I think I think that when when Paul goes to Mars Hill. And he's dealing with the philosophers there. He, he talks about uh, that creation speaks of God, that we, we, we're all an offspring of God. And uh, if, you, if you can get, if, if that first plank goes, then, every, you know, those first two chapters, those first three chapters in Genesis, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, if you get rid of those three chapters, then, the, then you've got rid of the foundation. So... Right. So it's absolutely uh, strategic mm -hmm. that those three chapters are defended historically, and that that God as a creator, God is defended because if yeah, that, I mean, that, sorry, go. On. I was just going to say the the very beginning of the Bible, God created the heavens and the earth. They they go right after that. I mean, it's, you know, yeah, it, and and they. Yeah, I mean, so they they by 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 going after that by 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 uh, bringing up the evolution thing, it, it brings up doubts of if that first sentence is even true or not. Yeah. And um, so it kind of by you know by by debunking that first statement, if they can show everything evolved by chance in a, a sort of an atheistic godless way, then it makes it essentially makes that first line a lie. Yeah. Which Everything that follows then would be based on a lie, and that's what they're that's what they're that's what they're hoping, you know. That's what they that's how they try to deconvert people. Yeah, and the the thing is, the monumental thing is, is evolution is the biggest lie going. Okay. Yeah, I, I was thinking the other day. I I, I really, I I I had that do uh, about three weeks ago with. Uh, I don't want to even mention her name. She just she does me head in. But there's this lady who claims to be some kind of scholar in evolution. Uh, and I asked her, I asked her a question. I asked her about uh, give me evidence um, for macro evolution, and she said, "No, you don't understand. Evolution is, is frequency change over frequency over." Change over frequency, something like frequency. Over yeah, frequency changes over time. And uh, I knew exactly. G frequency. Yeah. I, I absolutely was very clear in my head. I knew exactly what she was saying. It wasn't that I didn't understand, but I said to her, and, and I understood what Wikipedia, like the Wikipedia. I, I don't only just read Wikipedia, but other stuff as well, article like scholarly articles. But I understood the basic definition of what she was saying. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, look, I just want evidence. I, I, I don't dispute there is change in, mm -hmm. on, a, on a micro level. I said, I just want the evidence for macro. And she said, well, the evidence is this change, this frequency. And, and anyhow, she, did, she was nasty and she snapped at me. She wouldn't talk to me. And afterwards, a few weeks later, I was getting out of bed and I started laughing. I thought, what a monumental, monumental lie evolution is if you've got these professional evolutionists who are saying that it's frequency over time and then then it, it, it that is not the same no that's not the same as saying that that there is macroevolution that's a different thing to prove macroevolution is a different thing to say than to say that evolution is frequency or change over frequency over time or whatever. Yeah, gene frequency changes over time. Yeah, okay, so there's two things going on. Here's what you need to remember. So there, they, there's two opposing camps for creation, or for, for the emergence of humans and all the animals. See, they, they've done a misdirection on people, and they've, they've misdirected. Okay, so the Bible, the claim in, the, in, in God's Word in the Bible is that God created the heavens and the earth. God created humans, especially. He, he, he created everything. So evolution must 
they've misdirected people and they've made them focus on natural selection. But natural selection is not the issue. The issue is where the raw material, all of it, where, where all the novelty, all the, all the body parts, all the, the cells and the DNA, everything, all the physical anatomy, where it came from, the origin of the anatomy. Um, so, no, you know, it's, it's not uh, debatable that on some level natural selection works uh, mm. as some sort of a stabilizer or, you know, keep, keep populations from changing or moving different directions or even it may even work in the way that they say to some degree. But the issue is where did everything come from? There's got to be a positive creator under their scheme. And then natural selection comes along behind it, sure enough, if, if they want to say that and um, can make populations change. I don't particularly believe that. But, but even, even within their scheme, they've got to have a legitimate creator to substitute for the almighty creator who created us. Mm -hmm. And so the issue is they have no legitimate creator who can cre who, or that does create all the anatomy. Uh, and so we've got the whole bio, uh, biosphere that is yet to be accounted for all the bodies, all the cells, all the, you know, uh, like I was saying in another hangout, we've got like 70,000 miles of blood vessels. Um, it's just none of it is accounted for by way of mutation, and there's nothing they can do or say about it. So to get around that, they misdirect the conversation, and they say evolution is the change of uh, gene frequencies over time, but no one's ever demonstrated that changes in, in gene frequencies over time can change a mouse into a some sort of a, a primate, you yeah. know. And so they, they, like you were, kind of what you're saying, just because gene frequencies change over time does not mean that a bacteria can mutate into a, eventually a, an elephant or a human. And that's what we have, essentially, that, that's what they're saying we are. There is, that's, that's, that's a non sequitur. And so they're, they're basically tricking you by, by presenting something that happens and using that as evidence for something that's, you know, impossible. That, that, that is exactly how I was thinking. I thought, I, I thought this is just absolutely monumental, a lie. It's exactly what you said. It was a, it's a sleight of hand. It's a, it's a mm -hmm. like trick. They, they talk about this frequency change uh, as if that is the, if that is the whole, whole lot of evolution. And it's just a complete lie because it's not. And uh, and I just totally agree with you. And when when you, when you think about it, it's a it's this it's it's a monumental. It's a hoax. Yeah, it's 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 a total sham. Yeah, <laughs> it's a total sham. <laughs> so like when this person, this woman was going on about, you don't know, you don't know, you know, I'm thinking you don't know. It's just simple. I know what you're saying. Very clear what you're saying, but it. It's a sleight of hand. You're you're not actually dealing with the issue at hand. Uh, just because you can talk about frequency change over time or whatever, that does not answer the big question about how a mouse, how bacteria can turn into a mouse, and it, and it's a sleight of hand. And mm -hmm. and you don't have to be a genius to work that out, and you don't have to have a PhD to work that out. It's simple. It's intellectual dishonesty, and that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um. and, yet, and yet it's people like yourself or people like who who, uh, who defend creation or defend critique evolution get lambasted as and attacked, and yet these people are the ones that are the most anti-intellectual because they're not they're not actually logically realizing the error of of what they're saying. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, and the hard science. They 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 desperately desperately been experimenting with the animals, with different organisms back, especially back in the other, last century. Just desperately working with mutations to try to figure out how they could get a flea into a, you know change a flea into a fly, for example. Yeah. They've done all kinds of you know they've just been working for decades on this stuff on what in the world how can we get this creature to turn into this creature by mutating it and it just does not work yeah, yeah. Um, and so they just they just have absolutely nothing a mutated creature is almost always a defective creature you know there, very occasionally there may be a mutation that confers a benefit but it always almost always anyway 
has you know it it creates a defective creature in in you know uh, in a, in in a and it's not an unintended, but it, the, the one of the side, yeah. it, it causes a side dysfunction, you know. So ultimately making it a, a less functional creature overall. Um, but yeah, so the, the the scientific evidence is totally in the creationist favor. There There is no evidence that a bacteria can mutate into anything but a bacteria. Mm-hmm. And, and same thing with, all, you know, any other creature. That the most they can do... Is you know like what the the most they've accomplished with with experimenting with mutations on animals is you know um, is with the uh, butterfly uh, moths you know they can get antennas to, uh, to to move locations or they can duplicate certain you know like wings and and spots on their wings and they but duplications are not the same thing as uh, you know new um, New information. It's just it's just a duplication of what was already there, a copy. So that's the best the best they can do. Most of it, when it involves mutation, you know, ends up being either killing the animal or sickening it. Mm. So it's a total failure. And listening to you, like Tommy, like I I know that you study these things. I know that you study you know, whatever the opponents are saying. You study all the scholars. Who, who were in the field and stuff like that? You're not, you're not gonna. If if you're looking at evolution, you're not gonna pick up the Beano magazine, the the Beano comic or anything like that. You're gonna look at what other thinkers are saying and scholars and scientists and read them. And when you listen to like the Magic Sandwich or you listen to these atheist groups talk about people like yourself, me or any 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 uh, Christian apologist on YouTube or. They talk about us as if like we don't we're, we're like these idiots who just turn up and have been reading like comic magazines and we don't know what we're talking about and yeah. don't like read these we don't read Dawkins I mean I know you've read Dawkins mm-hmm. and and it, it it just makes me laugh really I think what what planet are they on do they really think that we don't actually you, if if like you mention anything, or if let's say we had a discussion on any topic, you'd, and we're going to meet schedule next week to talk on um, retroviruses or something like that, I will make sure before I turn up next week, I will go and read the leading articles in that field before I talk to you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That that yeah. normal standard practice, and yet these atheists think you don't do things like that. That we just Got our brains um, in mm-hmm. a bag, and we just don't know what's going on. I don't. Yeah, know. yeah, it's absolutely true. I mean, they, they treat you like you are a freak. Yeah, you know, you know, but you know, getting back to Dawkins, I mean, if you read his books on evolution, it's all philosophy. He he presents virtually nothing. He pre- like the blind watchmaker, he pre- he presents nothing for evidence. Yeah. Of of what you know he's peddling as far as the mechanism goes. So it's just it's just a brainwashing. And that's the thing. Um, these guys they only read, and I, I don't I don't want to paint them all like this, but generally what I come across when I talk to them is they don't read creationist books. They don't read intelligent design books. Mm. They don't read the other side. And a lot of times you'll bring up something that. They've never even heard hmm. uh, that argument, and so they don't know how to answer it. And because they just simply they they read their side and that's it. They get one side of the story. Hmm. You know, even you know, like in politics, you know, if you watch TV or at least you know or, or read, you know, it, occasionally, if you're a liberal, you might come across a conservative comment or at least. But but it's not like that in science. It's these guys. They don't. They just simply do not look at. The, they don't investigate the other side at all. Mm-hmm. So, it. <laughs> I I, yeah. I um, I was watching the Magic Sandwich show a couple of days ago, and they had a. a even though it's a bit on science, but it's a bit on philosophy. Is um, they had Gary Edwards. They had um, um, Aaron Ra, uh, Ozzy. DPI, uh, one or two others. And basically, the discussion was 
the value of philosophy. And a couple of the atheists like Aaron Rao were saying philosophy is not valuable. And Gary Edwards and Ozzy were saying philosophy is valuable. But what was interesting in that conversation is all of them, uh, Gary Edwards, Ozzy, all of them was painting the picture that creationists are dishonest. And secondly, if they touch on any topic, whether it be philosophy or science, they don't know the literature. So if you talk about philosophy, you won't know what the philosophers are saying, the secular philosophers are saying, uh, etc. And I, I just want to say to any atheist out there that if that's what you think, then you're, on, you're living on planet Mars, you, you're not in reality. Because I can tell you that any, any decent uh, Christian apologist uh, in any field will always lead, read the literature and a, a decent Christian who's been brought up uh, to to believe in Christianity will be taught to defend the faith and not to have the head in the sand but to know what's going on, what, what people are thinking. Um, hey Jason, I, I'll be back in about 30 seconds. I gotta, okay. I gotta get a sweatshirt. I'm freezing in here. <laughs> We're turning the heat up. All right, I'll just talk about I'll, this. Yeah, I'll be right back. So, so I'm I'm just saying that um, you know I I was I was appalled really uh, at um, at what I heard on the Magic Sandwich or uh, Gary Edwards and people like that their attitude uh, as if uh, Christians uh, don't read philosophy or are try say, saying that we pick bits of philosophy and and we just uh, use it for our own purposes like creation issues, bits of science for their own purposes. I just think that's just not fair because um, you know I've, I've talked about pragmatism uh, in the past and I've read um, the leading pragmatist in that field. Um, so I, I was just saying like um, the Magic Family Show and, and they were saying that, like in the area of philosophy, that if Christians talk about philosophy, just as the creationists they say pick bits of science that they want, that if Christians talk about philosophy, they just pick bits of it, but they don't really know the literature of the field. And I was just saying that like, I've talked about pragmatism in the past, and I've read um, John Dewey, William James, um, a variety of pragmatist philosophers. So when I'm talking about pragmatism, I know what I'm talking about. And it's the same with you. If you're talking about evolution, you've looked at what the other side's saying, and I just think it's a, it's not fair to, to say that we don't read the literature of whatever field we're looking at. You know, so, mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to bury that if anyone's listening, just to make sure that they that they realise they're not being fair there. Um, any other thoughts, mate? I've run out of thoughts. Um. Well, you know, just on that, I mean, when, you know, like on that, that magic sandwich show, those, those types of things, you know, they, they do get into philosophy. And personally, I, you know, kind of like what we were talking earlier, it's like I, I, I prefer to talk about the, you know, I hold their feet to the fire and actually get them to present the evidence. Yeah. But when they're, in, they're all together in the, in the group, uh, of atheists and they all think alike. They don't ever get into it, and no one ever, no one's, no one's ever there to ask them the tough question or to get them to to present the evidence. And so it, they they have a way of coming coming across as you know experts because yeah. you know you know what I'm saying because there's several of them. They all think the same way. They all sort of feed off of each other and add to each other's opinions, but they never question or doubt what they say. So. Like I say, they, they come across as being very intelligent, very authoritative, and I just sit back and laugh at them because, like, if I was there, I'd be shooting stuff down left and right and holding their feet to the fire. But you know, I don't, I don't get, I don't get invited. So, hey, 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 Toby, that's that, over the years. That's exactly how I felt with the Magic Subway Show. It, it kind of like, kind of reminds me of Chairman Mao and Stalin. If if they, you know, Stalin, if he did his radio broadcast or Chairman Mao, they. They do these these programs where it makes them look good, but yeah. Not the real thing, and that's what the Magic Sandwich shows like. It's kind of like it's like a set piece 
they, they don't really have anybody on long enough to really hold the feet to the, you know, and they're all, they always outnumber the Christians, they always outgun them, uh, and they, they never really get tested, they never get really challenged, and so it's just a set, it's a set piece, it's set up to, just to make them look good, and uh, they don't, yeah. you know, I uh, totally exactly. Agree. Yeah, I mean, you know, you brought up Ozzy a second ago. He he's one of these guys that I really do enjoy watching. Yeah. And I think he's I think he's in his in his you know he's a brilliant guy really. Yeah. In in his you know he's he studies philosophy and he's very well spoken and I but man I would just freaking love to get him on a one on one thing. I mean, just something casual, just like yeah. It's like okay, man, you know. Let me show me how what your philosophy is manifests itself in the real world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's frustrating because I, I love listening to him, just because I like to hear I like to hear the other side. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but what he says is all philosophy, and that's the thing. That's the other thing. These guys, they are all philosophy, and it's, it's none of it is actually legitimate when you get into the real world. When you get into actual science. Yeah, yeah. You know, the evolution stuff is just all in their heads. Yeah, yeah. And um, so, but, you know, Ozzy, is, uh, he's not much on debate, I don't think, it, you know, confrontational debate anyway, so I understand. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, that they'll do pieces that make them look good, uh, but they won't, uh, they won't come out and play fair. <laughs> it's it's kind of like... Uh, it's kind of they, they'll only do it when it suits them and and if they hold the cards they won't do it if or, unless that's the case. And if you notice, they they like to do it in packs. You know, they 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 get it together in packs like wolves, and they they seem to operate in you know much uh, more effectively like that. I mean, can you imagine if it was switched the other way around? If it was six or seven very informed Christians against one evolutionist, I mean. Yeah. So, you, you, yeah, I mean, it would be steamrolled the other direction. But yeah. not to mention the Christian, the creationists, um, you know, honestly are, are on firmer footing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, they would be exposed, you know, terribly if it was like that, if, it was, if, if the shoe was on the other foot. But that's what they like, you know. Yeah. I think it makes, it makes them feel safer, too. But I, 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 I do think that, People need to realise that there is there is a uh, um, what can I say? Uh, how, how how do you put it? there is, there is like propaganda going on where like the Magic Sandwich Show and and shows like that where they they have these atheists on and they, they have these deep kind of so called intellectual conversations, but they're not tested and and so it makes them look good. It makes them look as if they're okay and. But they, they won't they won't be challenged in a you know when when it does happen when Aaron Ra met Matt Slick mm -hmm. uh, you saw what a professional uh, a real professional apologist who knows his stuff Christian apologist can do to one of these kind of atheists because I don't know if you saw that debate but yes. I, it was diabolical I thought it was I'm I'm not just saying it. Even if I weren't a Christian, I really thought that debate, within the first five minutes, it was over, I thought, because it's yeah. Aaron Ra to be really ignorant about what he was talking about. He really didn't know what he was talking about. I don't know what you think, but... No, I mean, I, I had never... i would seen snippets of him commenting on things before. He's one of these guys I just... You know, I'm not really interested in following him. I don't really care what he says. Yeah. There's several... You know, high-profile atheists on YouTube. That I just don't even pay attention to. So he's one of them. But I did sit down and watch that, and I, it was probably just like you said, a few minutes into it. I guess my mouth was hanging open, just like, is this guy? I mean, for real? I mean, this guy is the top of the heap for this crew. And if he is, that's that's really a sad indictment of 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 them as a group. I hope he's not, but. It was just a. It was. It was really. I thought it was embarrassing for him. That, that's what I thought. I. I. I thought the first five minutes. I. I. I was. I felt sorry for him. I'm not just saying it, but I did. I felt. But, so, I felt and I, I would like to say too, though. I mean, a lot of times it's like in football. 
you know, a team can look really bad, but it a team can look bad because the opposing team is really good. And I think that's probably what it was in that situation. I thought Matt Slick was really good. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, some, someone else in that seat, you know, might not have been able to, to make Aaron, Aaron, how do you say it, uh, you know, make make him look as bad. But I thought Matt Slick was really good. Yeah, I, I did. Uh, but I, I thought that, I just thought, like, I think a few people said that the first five minutes it was just all over and... Uh, I was just embarrassed. I just felt sorry for him. I thought this is just ridiculous. Um, mm-hmm. it, it wasn't even. Um, I mean, this issue about science and 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 uh, saying that he there was nothing that he had he believed that was of faith. That he, that everything that he believed was all based on science. All based. Yeah. On, and I thought, what planet is the guy on? Is this guy for real? I just thought this is crazy. Well, and and his, you know, him sticking to the story that <laughs> that he's not faith based at all. He doesn't he doesn't have any faith in anything. You know, the very the very um, fact that he believes nature did it that's faith based proposition. If he doesn't believe God did it, then he believes nature did it. So that that right there, I mean, he wasn't there at the very beginning to know if nature did it or not. Yeah, yeah. So nature did it is is just as faith based as God did it. Yet he can't see it. He he doesn't believe he has faith in anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and he stuck to that. I was like, dude, man, you need to you need to knock that off. He won't give it up, would he? He kept going on, and the no. went on. The more he kept burying himself. <laughs> and then in the end, in the end, Matt got a bit stroppy with him at the end, and he said, "Yeah, well, you, you've got real faith in your abilities." To reason, yeah, yeah. I think Matt. I think Matt was just as dumbfounded as the audience was, and he, you know, when you come across inane comments constantly, it's like, what do you do with it? I mean, where do you go with that? Yeah. So I think towards the end, he sort of lost it and just like told, yeah. told, him, told him what he was thinking. Finally, yeah, yeah, because I like halfway through the debate, Matt slick in his chair. He was like, he was like shaking his head. What he was yeah. Like, yeah, he's like, is, is this kid for real? <laughs> what? What's this going on? <laughs> oh, and what what was funny, or what I thought was just as funny as the debate was, the comments of the the atheists. You know, they're they're like they huddled around them like atheists generally do, and they and they they defended him like and, and made it sound like he just you know destroyed Matt Slick. Matt Slick's an idiot, but it was just funny watching them circle around and. You know, so, so, basically lie. Yeah, try to try to uh, cover his tracks and uh, make it yeah. look better than it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what they do. Yeah. But, but uh, I'd encourage people if you get a chance, go down to Bible Thumping Wingnuts uh, channel. Go and have a look at the debate. Aaron Ra v Matt Slick, and you're in for a real treat because it was a great debate from Christian side. It was it was uh, it was brilliant. Yeah, I watched a few watched a few uh, debates by Matt Slick recently. Uh, about three or four, uh, Dan Barker one. Um, um, what's his name? Um, Matt Delonte. Mm-hmm. And I just bounced this idea off you. Just t- tell me what you think. But Matt Slick take takes uh, presuppositionalism and evidentialism. He takes a he, he mixes it. He has a variety of, of styles that he puts together, and uh, I just wondered what you thought of that because I, I think that if if you use presuppositional apologetics, you do, I, I know I know what I know that the presuppositionalists say. Uh, well, you, I just I just say this. It's a bit it's a bit convoluted, but the presuppositionalists, the idea is that you talk about their presuppositions and you ask questions about that and you show their inconsistencies with their presuppositions. And there's this idea by some presuppositionalists, I won't name names, that you don't give evidences because if you give evidences, um, you're giving the the Christian the, the non Christian, the unbeliever, an opportunity to judge. I think that's a twisting of presuppositionism. I don't think that's the how the founders of presuppositionalism saw it. But 
Matt Slick, what he does is he takes evidentialism and presuppositionism. And uh, I just wondered what you thought about that. Mm, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. <laughs> well, yeah, the, 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 the philosophy thing is just, it's fun to watch, but I just can't even begin to really discuss it. I mean, I, I enjoy, and I, and I sit there and I watch these preceptors do what they do, and I, I, think it's, I think it's effective. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably not something I should even comment on. <laughs> I'd probably come on something. Well, I, I, I think that personally, uh, I, I just think that uh, Francis Schaeffer used both. He used evidence and he used the presuppositionalism. That's what Matt Slick's doing. He's using both. He's using, you know, because he talks with Aaron Ra about logic um, and that's like the presuppositional stuff. But he, he was also able to talk about evidence where he talked about uh, physics and the nature of physics and how that related to cause and effect and stuff like that. So I think uh, putting the two together is uh, a good thing. Yeah, that sounds like that sounds like a good plan because I mean I like that too. I mean because ultimately there are a lot of people who you know like myself when before I was saved. I mean I was investigating you know what exactly is the truth you know so I, I kind of dove into some of that stuff and it's like. You know, like uh, uh, you know, the fossil record, for example, or, or the, the legitimacy of, of evolution. And so, there's a lot of people out there with with a lot of questions in that regard. But ultimately, though, I think there there comes a time when that evidential argument can only go so far. You know, you've got to. I mean, to me, I I did not become a Christian, or I did not. Nothing happened for me really until I repented the the very first time when when I got on my knees and said, "God, you are Creator. I'm a sinner. You're righteous and holy. I'm not." Um, and so, it was only after I repented that that really, I mean, I just totally changed. And so it didn't change when I read about evolution or if I read about uh, archaeology as it, in regards to. Uh, the Bible, or you know, all of that. So that, all that stuff was interesting, but the real change in me came when, you know, when I repented. And um, so that's that's. I think um, when it comes to, you know, I, I guess that's all I'm saying is 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 the evidence. And I've I've noticed this all in these hangouts. You can present evidence to your blue in the face, and yeah, yeah. these these guys. It, it, it doesn't really mean anything to them. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think there is something to it. I totally, but it, it can only go so far, I think. I totally agree. There's, um, I just read that passage. I, 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 I've got to watch myself there, Tommy, because I, I enjoy apologetics. You can, you know, like you said, it, 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 it's good, but you've got to be careful because ultimately it comes down to them finding God. Uh, it, uh, this passage here, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, um, it says, verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we, have, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with the spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. So, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So, that backs up what you're saying. It's only until they have their spiritual eyes opened and they see that they're a sinner and they need a saviour, will they ever really understand. So, I totally agree with you, mate. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I remember years and years ago, um, 
reading Francis Schaeffer's, uh, I, I, I was very cynical and I found it hard to believe. And um, I used to read uh, Francis Schaeffer books because uh, he like looked at he, he like I I, I liked um, novels and plays and philosophy and so on. his books like cover the history of philosophy and stuff like that and uh, they're really really good but in the end it, it came down to I had to trust the Lord as my personal savior just like you and then. That's when all the things started to fall into place about my questions about God and the evidences for God came into play after right. when, I, when I yielded to him. Right. So I totally agree, mate. Yeah. And something I, it's kind of a sidebar I've noticed, at least with myself, and maybe I was just going to see if you're like this too. It's almost like when... Um, when someone's pres it's almost like the evidence is more is more convincing when I find it on my own as opposed to when someone is presenting evidence. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like if you if you really are on a search for the truth, if you're an atheist or agnostic or something like that in between, it's almost like I mean it's almost like you almost have to read it for yourself as opposed to have someone preach it to you or teach it to you or pound it into your head. I mean, it's you, you've got to, or for me, that's that's how it worked. And and having said that, it's it's almost as as well that I don't get near as much watching somebody on a video as I do reading. You know, like I think I think there's something about reading that imprints it on your heart a little bit better, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but um, yeah. It, it, that's a really interesting observation because in my own experience, the only, the things that really get into my soul and get into my system is exactly what you just said when I've spent time myself in, mm -hmm. in studying reading. I've never been in a debate or a discussion, I, I don't think, where maybe once or twice, but 95% of the time I think it goes over my head. But it, not, not because uh, it, it, it's just because um, the debates it's more confrontational the discussions you try to be open and listen to what they're saying but often um, they're not as deep and profound as they think they are mm -hmm. um, but when you go and study yourself and read um, I don't know it, it's true you're so right it goes deep and that's my experience. Yeah, I just wondered if if you were like that person because I know everybody's different. So I just I'm like you. I'm I'm like you. The, it's I, like if, yeah, if I, if I watch a video, you know, some a hangout or something, it, you know, it's interesting, but rarely does the information that it, as profound as it might be, you know, it doesn't usually stick with me. Whereas if I read something, then it really kind of get it, it can get etched into you. You know, internally. But yeah. anyway, it's just a sidebar. I'm just curious what you what your experience was. I I kind of um, there's kind of stuff that I like. There's kind of topics that I like and enjoy. Like I like there might be a scholar. Like I'm I'm into at the moment the early church fathers, so I like to read about them. And when I'm reading about them and reading their stuff or reading writers about them, I really get into it. Another topic is. The canon of scripture. I enjoy. I've been enjoying that recently. Um, so I'll get into it, and I really enjoy it. Then there's. I'm. I'm a bit of a debate junkie. So what mm. I do is I, I watch about three debates at least a week. Sometimes it can be like six debates a week. So I listen to because um, what I do before I go out street preaching, I listen to a debate or a, a preacher preaching or something. When you go out and you and you talk to people, what is your main um, well, the people's main objection to what you're saying? The main the main objection. Uh, main objection. Uh, I think. I mean, is it do, do they just not care, or do they disbelieve because of some sort of an evidence, or some you know, is it evolution, or? I, th I think. Um, 
quite a, quite a quite a lot don't seem to be bothered. Uh, there's quite quite a lot of apathy in our country. So mm -hmm. me, a lot of people, I'd say about fifty percent, who were just not interested. Um, yeah. Then most of the objections, I think, are number one, science. Science proves science has shown that that prove Christianity wrong. I think that's one that a lot of young people come up with. Um, secondly, uh, why does God allow evil, suffering? Mm -hmm. um, and then the next one to that is what the Muslims pump, and, and that is that the Bible's changed. So those are the three main ones that come up regularly. Science, problem of evil, and the Bible's changed. That's what comes out. Mostly, yeah, mostly. And, just, and just people who are distracted or don't care, you know, that's that's the boat I was in. I mean, it's just amazing. I guess that's why I brought it up because so many people in society, you know, they, they know all about the um, the people in Hollywood who's sleeping with who or who's having whose baby, but and so so few people really are interested at all, even in the even in the debate at all over over God. You know, this this debate community is. You know what? Maybe, you know, maybe several hundred people here. But look, I mean, look at look how big our countries are. Millions and millions of people. What in, in the United States? Three hundred fifty million people, and we have a couple hundred, three, maybe five hundred or thousand mm. on in the debate community. It's just there's so many people. We're, I think the devil has done such an incredible job distracting everybody with computers and iPods and phones and just mm. yeah, you know, yeah. people. Um, you know, they they look at religious people like they're just clowns. Like like why why, what's the point? You know we're having so much fun with this other stuff. It's just really sad. And I think and that's that's one thing about technology. I think is in a way kind of a tool of the devil. You know it just is is a just an utter distraction to a lot of people unless you use it right. Um, but I don't know. I'm not. I'm not a big fan of technology. I know I'm kind of hypocritical saying that, talking on a computer, but <laughs> I think it's done a lot of harm to society in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, um, my, my sister, uh, she, um, she had a, a house burgled uh, a few weeks ago, and she was a bit upset, and she, she wanted me just to stay over one day, so I went and stayed. And uh, she had uh, this computer game. It's like a a, a box. I'm, I'm not. In, I'm, I don't know much about these kind of computer. I've got computer games, but not not like these kind of computer games. It's like a box, and then you have a um, you put a DVD in. It comes on your television, and then uh, you've got like um, like a, a, a something in your hand that you can direct the thing on the television. And I, and I thought I'll just put it on. She says you can put it on if you want. So I put it on. And I thought this is amazing. It's like real life. It was like mm -hmm. it like it felt like it was a it, this one was a zombie thing. This this guy with his little kid ran through the streets. And it was like as if I was there. And I thought, mm -hmm. boy, this is in most homes and it is. Most kids have got this kind of thing. I thought the world's going crazy. Yeah. It's going crazy because this is like real life, and kids are doing this. Man, it was frightening, and I thought, and you know, some of and she she had my my sister's like uh, I don't know, twenty eight, twenty nine, and she's got like Call of Duty and uh, these things, you know, like machine guns and that. And I put one on, and and there was this guy, and he's got his rifle, and it was like I was literally felt like I was sat in a real battlefield, and I thought. Boy, this is what people are, are getting all the time. Families are, are letting the kids on with these things. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, it's it's in a way. I mean, it's. I mean, I'm sure it's 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 addicting and fun and incredible. Uh, but you know, ultimately, that stuff. There's so many kids and adults, even that you know, they're inside doing that. You know, as opposed to going outside, going for a walk. You know. Doing, doing stuff that people used to do all the time, just you know, 20 years ago. Mm. And uh, but I I don't know. I guess I'm a. Um, I think I was born in the wrong century. I, I think I I kind of crave the simple life, 
And sometimes I wish I was born in the uh, 1500s or something. <laughs> well, I've got, I've got a mate. I, I won't say his name because he won't like me saying his name. Uh, I've got a mate who we go out street preaching, and he's just like you. He says the same. He, he always says, I feel like I'm in the wrong, se wrong century. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it could be worse than I guess. Well, I think um, I often... Um, you, you know, the vast multitudes don't seem to be interested, but, you know, I think a lot of them have made a conscious decision because, um, you know, in, I don't know what it's like where you are, but in Manchester there's a lot of street preachers, there's a lot of evangelists, and the people in Manchester have had the gospel. They've been, they've been given it by the bucketful over the last ten years, and... So when people walk past you in Manchester, many people have probably had a track, they probably heard the preacher, and mm. then they seem to have made a conscious decision that they're not interested. And yet you go to another city like Liverpool, where there's been not a lot of street preachers, they are quite open, they are more open in that city. That's interesting. Yeah, so, you know, we get a lot more feedback, a lot more interest in and not as much opposition, not as much aggressiveness, uh, and not as much apathy. There is, you know, people are interested. And I think um, the other thing as well, in, in Liverpool, there is there has been over the years, like the last hundred years, it's mainly a Catholic um, city. So they have, even though they don't know the gospel, they have some kind of background, they have some kind of education in the Bible. So when you talk to them, they're understanding your language, they're understanding when you talk about sin and things like that. Whereas people in Manchester, a lot of them, they've not got any background to, very little background about Christianity, so you're basically starting from scratch. And whatever they've seen on the streets, street preachers or evangelism, you know, they've made a decision that they don't want to know, so, so that's, that's our background in the north of England. Mm. I mean that's just sad. I mean that basically, I I mean it seems like so much of society is just shielded from from anything that you know anything anything regarding Christianity is just silenced. It's just sad. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we we got a real battle in our country. I mean, I mean it's far. It's been gone a long time, you know. We got a, a state church, um, the Anglican Church, and the the person who's in charge of the church, the the Archbishop, he's chosen by the Prime Minister. The Prime hmm. Minister gets to church, church choose, and the Queen gets to choose the top die top guy of the Church of England. And basically, the Church of England is just a sleeping giant. You know, it's just. It's just like uh, just quiet. It doesn't really say anything, do anything. Doesn't challenge the state. Doesn't speak out against sin, and and compromises on sin. You know, so so it's not yeah. a good situation, really. Well, I mean, it's you know become politically incorrect to to question anybody who's misbehaving. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, and that's that's common, mm. even here. I mean, it's just how dare you, you know, talk about somebody who's, you know, sexually, you know, going bananas, or you know, if you're in a, I don't know, I'm getting into that, but but yeah, just criticizing people at all is is pol politically incorrect. Mm. I I think. I think uh, I heard uh, I've heard Steve Lawson, uh, preacher, and Paul Washer, and a few others saying we're going to get more and more persecuted. And I I, I feel that um, I I don't know I I just feel that thing you know I don't know what you think about the end times, but I I do think that we we're, we're near the end times myself. I think we're coming to a a climax. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, I do. I mean, if if 
we got so many so many different crazy people around the world that could possibly kill kill us all. And and if that doesn't happen, I don't see how humanity can survive the the mutations that we're under that they're, that we're undergoing. So it's going to be one of the one of the one of the two. I think pretty quickly, it's either going to be destruction of the world by some sort of a bomb or something in that regard or I mean it may not happen as quickly but you know the, the human genome is is devolving and degenerating incredibly rap rapidly I mean that's that's one of the things that goes underreported sure. but science knows very well the the big problem that that well look at all the look at all the ge the new genetic diseases we're getting you know humanity's getting and, and we're, we're we're all getting you know all these new diseases. We're we're getting less fit. We're and and our our our, our genes are just mutating at a at warp speed. Hmm. And uh, so I don't see how we could how we can survive that. You know people talk about maybe a thousand more years or, or whatnot. I I see I see no way. Even if there's no wars or no bombs, I see no way humanity can last that long. At least in any sort of functional way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I I personally I. I I don't know when the Lord exactly will come back, but I, I do think that it's pretty soon because I, I just, like you said, I, I think that uh, things are conspiring at the moment where where um, it only takes an idiot to let one of these nuclear bombs off and you've got a nuclear war and stuff like that. And, um, so I, the thing is, is, is the church as well, I mean, it talks about the apostasy in the church and I feel that that's a problem, and I don't think Christians are aware of it. They're not really seeing the problem. Um, I, 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 that's why I enjoy going out. I just enjoy it because you're telling people and sharing the gospel because of the, 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 the needy times. Yeah, they, they really are. So when are you going to start, um, not to put pressure on you, but... <laughs> Wow. I, do, I, really, I really do enjoy your Bible lesson, so well, I've got um I've got a Bible message. I was going to do it tonight, uh, but I, I had this seminar, so I thought I'd do that. But uh, I'll probably preach it tomorrow, or maybe in the next day or two. Uh, it's on two Timothy. Uh, yeah. I, pre I preached it in the church a few weeks ago, and I'll, I'll probably preach it. Uh, so so m maybe tomorrow I'll probably do it, uh, Tommy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I really, I really do, um, really do love that. I think you have, I think you know, I think you have a great gift. Thanks. Man. And um, seriously, I mean, you, you have a way of, of delivering the message that is, you know, it's, it's very commendable. It's, it's just, it is. I don't know. I, I think I told you earlier, but it, it really does. Um, I just, I just lay down usually at night is when I kind of calm down and I'll read the Bible or I'll listen to some you know some message uh, that's not evolution related or, or that kind of stuff I, I try to I try to you know simple simplify myself in the evening and, and get to what's you know what's important before I go to bed but but you um, I do love your stuff so yeah I, whenever whenever it's uh, I know you were talking about you know maybe starting after the first of the year, but but I do do love. Well, that, that, that it's because of your comment that I felt a bit encouraged. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, it's different conversing with atheists, you yeah. know, and and I know you've had some trouble with that, but you know, it's it's different talking to atheists as opposed to just making just making straight up Bible lesson or, or Bible study, you know. Well, that, that that that's that's my gift. That's what I enjoy most. I enjoy in in real life. That's what I do. That is preach the word of God. So that's what I need to do. Stick to that. That's what I'm gifted at. Yeah, I mean, and they don't even have to be long. Yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes I know, you know, it can be to make a video. Maybe it seems like it's um, you know, sometimes it can be long, but you know, even a short message is good sometimes too. Yeah. Yeah. So have you been reading anything at the moment, or what's been happening on... Uh, can I ask a couple of questions, and then we'll, we'll have to call it a day in a minute, because it's, it's one o'clock. Yeah it's, yeah, it's getting late there. Um, can I ask a couple of questions? Um, 
Have you been reading anything good at the moment, either in the Bible or in your evolutionary studies or whatever, or anything that struck you recently? Um, hmm. mm, it's not hitting me at the moment. <laughs> what about um, what about um, these debates and discussions? What what's been going on there? What what's been happening? What what has been the main issue that's been being brought up, and what's your response to it? You know, um, <laughs> I'm sorry to draw a blank two questions in a row. <sighs> the only thing I've noticed on Hangouts is, and it's happening more and more, is it seems like the the Christians are kind of talking amongst themselves more and the atheists are kind of doing the same thing. We're, we're kind of, I think we're getting, as a group, we're kind of getting tired of each other, which may not be a bad thing, but in a way, because <clears throat> I'm not sure how much is actually accomplished when we get together and, and <laughs> disagree violently with each other. But I guess I've just noticed that, and, and I do actually converse or enjoy conversing with Christians much more than atheists. Yeah, yeah. You know, just that com camaraderie between people who think and feel and, you know, have have a, have that in common. Yeah. You know, is is what I enjoy. But as far as specific topics, um, you know, that a lot of the topics get kind of brought up over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but not, nothing's really standing out. I guess. Like, I guess I'm still in the um, the twilight of making that video, <laughs> 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 which is all, which is fun. So, I guess. Did you see the last one that I made? I, I haven't I haven't told me, but I will do tomorrow, mate. I promise. Yeah. Check it out. It's with Alex Botton. With Alex Botton? When was? Yeah. You, you gotta go see it. <laughs> when, when did you do this? Uh, I don't know. I think I probably finished it uh, a few days ago. I posted yeah. it two or three days ago. I'll definitely be watching that, mate. It's <laughs> it's my alter ego, so you know. I have this. I have this alter ego that comes out. That there's, you know, I've got to have some sort of an outlet, and that's what it is. All right. <laughs> well, when when I close here before I go to bed, I will take a quick look at it, mate. Yeah, it's just it's just a few minutes long, about four or five minutes. Yeah. But, um, it's more of the same. I don't know if you've seen the other ones, but it's it's more of the same, but it's kind of kicked up a notch. And since Alex is in it, you know, he's. It's. <laughs> I'll just say it's a little uncomfortable. I I watch I watch the mainly where I've watched you is on Google Hangouts. I've enjoyed watching you on them. That's what I I've seen you at. Well, th yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate talking to you, Jason. It's good to good you, to hear from you again. You told me when before I go to bed in a minute. I'm going to just treat myself to your video and. Uh, I just want to thank you, mate, and I really appreciate you. And uh, I hope, I hope uh, in, the new, in the new year we can encourage each other and build each other up and and uh, strengthen each other in the faith over the next year. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I, I honestly, I just, I, I appreciate you. I know you. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where I just, I just appreciate you presenting the gospel. Like you do, and it's it's easy to get a, get on here on Google Hangouts and shoot the bull and and debate, um, but it's but you actually get on here and, and and present the gospel, and it's obvious and true that that the Lord lives in you and is in your heart, and it's very it's it's um it's 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 a good thing to watch. So I appreciate you, love you. Thanks, mate, and love you too, bro. And thanks for coming on tonight. You're welcome. Thanks for thanks for the chat. All right, mate. See you soon, yeah. All righty. Take care. Take care. God bless. Bye bye.